I recently accepted an invitation from my wife's stepfather, Dr. Paul Shepson, to witness his climate research over the Arctic Ocean. I knew it was an opportunity of a lifetime. Barrow, Alaska is essential to climate research because of its proximity to the sea ice blanketing our Arctic Ocean. It's also a great location for Dr. Shepson to collect air samples with his experimental plane. How you doing? Good to see you. Welcome to paradise. mutual respect here, that the Inupiat people understand that we're here to try to understand the natural environment and how humans are impacting the unnatural environment. There's a community here of about 5,000 people, maybe half of which are, are Inupiat Eskimos. It's a fascinating and great place to work because of the interaction between the scientists and the Eskimos. It was surprising to hear the local people support what the scientists are doing. They're different in many ways, but it's these differences that bring their work together in an amazing collaboration. It's just interesting to learn about where you live from somebody else. <laughs> so that's part of what we're studying. Part of what I was studying, we had a plane here and we were flying, um, and so I had an instrument on the plane that was actually sampling that haze. Uh -huh. And so what we think is that haze is mostly formed from pollution that's transported from Russia. The wisdom that they have from being up here and watching the sea ice over several decades and understanding you know, how it's changing. Most recent years, I've noticed the ice changing a lot. The ice comes in faster. It goes out quicker. It, you know, large pieces of ice are moving a lot faster than they used to be. Scientists probably wouldn't have a general idea of, of how the ice conditions will be and how certain conditions act, or if you looked at a, a certain pan of ice and they might not be able to tell if it was young ice. Young ice is uh, a year old and it's, sometimes it's only like five, six inches thick. The locals call it young ice, but it's actually first year ice. Explain to me, you know, the sea ice and, and what it's made up of. Okay, so... Um, and you only have two sentences. Two sentences, you're gonna have to cut them. Yeah, well, so the first year ice might be this thick, and multi-year ice can be very thick, like 15 feet, 20 feet thick. And so it takes more energy to melt that. But if you want a real expert on the ice characteristics, then Chris is a good person to talk to. And where would I find him? probably out on the ice. That, that's where, his, where he does his work. I found Chris a couple miles out on the sea ice. He studies the structure of the sea ice and how that affects the way it melts. We're looking at a, a scene that's just distinctly white. Everything around us is, is just completely white. There's snow on top of it, and even the ice underneath is, is pretty light colored. Almost all of the sunlight that's hitting this surface is being reflected up into space. A white surface is reflective, a black surface is not. Now, if we could see out far enough to where the open lead is out here, this ice is breaking apart and the wind is blowing it offshore, and there's actually open water out there. That open water, when you look at it, is just dark. And dark means it absorbs almost all the sunlight that hits it. 
And that's why the sea ice is really important to our planet, because it actually serves as a big reflector sitting up here on the top of the planet. If the sea ice is here covering up that dark ocean, we can reflect an awful lot of energy back out into space and keep the planet cooler than it otherwise would be. As soon as that sea ice starts to go away just a little bit, we open up that ocean, that ocean absorbs a whole lot more sunlight, that additional sunlight that's been absorbed in the ocean heats the ocean. That warm ocean water goes over, touches the ice that's still there, and melts more of the ice. Once you melt a little more ice, you expose more ocean. And that certainly is accelerating climate change. you had built, right? You'd invest it and it, now you're getting the return. Well, unfortunately, that's where the money is, right? So wherever the money is, yeah. people, and rightfully so, if I'm getting paid by big oil, I'm not going to say, oh, we should do something else. Last year's dividend was $800, and uh, last year the wind was west quite a bit, and the ice was pretty thin, and it melted and broke away much quicker than it usually did in the past. We get most of our food from the sea, the walrus, the seals, the, the whales, the fish. I want to teach my sons, and, and when I get old enough to be a grandfather, and my grandsons to keep hunting from the sea, 
with the changing climate, you know, and uh, it's unsafer to be out there because it's getting so thin and it breaks away and floats away really quick. If we could turn it around and get these seasons back and make the ice conditions in the springtime safer, uh, I think I, I would definitely trade that back in for, for an annual check that I get every year. Uh, it, there is a, a balance that needs to be maintained between the oil companies and the local communities here. In all, the impacts that are happening here, I, I think I would, I would go for our climate. I would like to have that back uh, in a perfect world anyways. The local community has rare access to the climate science community, and the effects of climate change are much more dramatic here in the Arctic. But I fear by the time the rest of the world accepts the reality of our situation, it'll be far too late. Not everybody just gets to come up here and, and actually see the environment changing and the ice changing and this is what the Arctic's like and, it's, uh, and it is changing. And I mean, you know, what happens up here affects what happens down, uh, say, other places. I mean, it, it's a whole world. It's not two different worlds, you know. We're all on one planet and uh, yeah, that's kind of what I believe. Let's move to the Tucked in your 